My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome all you guys to the College of Complexes. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. One, we'll have a brief announcements period. The second part is where our speaker will speak for up to an hour thereabouts. Then we will have a question and answer period, followed by our infamous rebuttal period. There are two things in the College of Complexes that two rules you should say that we uh, try to observe. One is one fool at a time, and the second is no personal attacks. Oh. Our program tonight is the Prisoner's Rights Program of the Uptown People's Law Center. For over 35 years, the People's Law Center has fought on behalf of Illinois prisoners. UPLC is the only group that actively represents prisoners in both class action matters as well as individual cases. UPLC has a database of correspondence with well over 10,000 prisoners. They receive over 100 letters a week from people in, in all of the Illinois prison facilities as well as federal, other state and county facilities. Additionally, they receive hundreds of phone calls from family members of prisoners who will try to assist as much as possible. UPLC has multiple class action lawsuits and several other lawsuits currently filed against the entire against the state of Illinois for unconstitutional prison conditions. Only lawsuits will ultimately change the Illinois prison system for the better. UPLC assists prisoners in various matters, including denial of adequate medical care, excessive force matters, denial of religious rights, discrimination across access to the courts, due process, and cruel and unusual punishment. Through the pro bono network, UPLC is able to find legal representation for many of these cases. UPLC does not represent individuals in criminal appeals. As part of the Prisoner's Rights Program, we provide our other attorney's advice upon litigating prison cases and other related information. Our lawyers and paralegals have extensive knowledge of the prison system, prison litigation, and information about the Illinois Department of Corrections. Sir, I didn't, get you, uh, I didn't get your name, so please introduce yourself. I'll do it myself. I can handle that. Let's welcome our speaker. Good evening. Good evening. All right. My name is Alan Mills. I am the executive director of the Uptown People's Law Center. Uh, we've actually been there for 40 years. Uh, the stuff you read was three years, was five years old. Uh, I started volunteering at the Uptown People's Law Center back in 1979 uh, as a second year law student. I thought I was just going to live in Chicago for three years of law school and then head back to the East Coast where I grew up. Uh, instead, Uptown and Chicago hooked me and I've been here ever since. I'm only about 38 years past my deadline of moving, but you know, it may happen eventually. You never know. What I really want to talk about today is our prison system, how we got here, and what kind of a mess we have, and maybe a little bit about what we can do about it, um, and some of our work, of course. But mostly I want to talk about the prison system. Uh, the most important thing about prisons is they're huge. Wow. Much huger than they have ever been in the history of the United States. Up until roughly the mid-70s, the population of our prisons grew at about the same rate as the population of our country. It went up a little bit in, during the Depression, it went down a little bit during World War II when judges would kind of offer criminals saying you can join the Army or go to jail. A lot of them chose the Army. Uh, and, but then in 1975, it skyrocketed so that we now lock up both more people and a higher percentage of our population than any other country in the entire history of the world, and certainly than of this country's history. It is now seven times as large as it was in 1972. Seven times. It's a huge, unwieldy system. Even looking at Western Europe, the places we try to compare ourselves to, there's a big variation in Western Europe as to how, why there's such a difference in their prison populations. Some people say it's because, like the United Kingdom, they have a history of, of class discrimination, uh, there's a history of immigrants coming in from because of their imperialist history. Denmark, for example, has a better social safety, safety net, much more homogenous society. Lots of papers and debates as to why Denmark may be a lot uh, less incarcerating than the UK. What those papers don't talk about is the United States, because we're just in a different world. Once you add the United States in there, Europe looks dead flat. 
You notice I had to actually change the uh, scale here. If we left the old scale, which only went up to 140, I think we'd be up somewhere on the third floor of this building uh, for the U.S. Back bar. So it's not just unprecedented in the United States, but it is unprecedented everywhere in the world. We now lock up more people than any other country in the world, including places like China and India, which have 10, 20 times the population we do, and a higher percentage of people than any other country in the world, including Russia at the time that they were running their gulag. We now lock up a higher percentage of our population than any other country has ever locked up in the history of the world. Did you hear that? Can you repeat that? I can repeat it as long as, as often as you want. <laughs> we lock up more people and a higher percentage of our population than any other country has in the entire history of the world. Mm, thank you. Anywhere. Yeah. And that huge prison population is no longer in any way connected to the crime rate. <laughs> As you can see, the red lines on the top there, that's the crime rate. It's gone up and down, up and down, up and down <laughs> since the 60s. Um, but since 1990, it has consistently gone down. So despite what you would think from reading the press, we are not in the midst of a huge crime wave. There's less crime now than there's been at any time since the 1960s. Yet our prison population has continued to go up and up and up. So we lock up people not because there's more crime, but because we've decided that the solution to a lot of our social problems is to lock the problem behind prison walls rather than try to solve it. This experiment, mass incarceration, is not being evenly distributed by, across this country. It is not an experiment on white people. It's an experiment mostly on young black men. Among young black men who have dropped out of high school, over 50% will go to prison at some point in their, before they're at the age of 35. Over 50%. That's about seven times, five, five times the rate of white young people who have dropped out of high school. That means, that sends a message to the rest of society that if you see a young black man walking down the street, you should think of them as a criminal because we're going to lock them away. That sends a message to society as to how we should look at race. The other horrifying thing about this slide here and these statistics is even among college graduates, there's still a five to one ratio. Obviously, a lot less people go to prison if you're black or white if you've graduated from college. But even among college graduates, if you're a black man who's graduated from college, you're much more likely to go to prison, five times as likely to go to prison. The gap remains exactly the same whether you're a college graduate or whether you're a high school dropout. Some people say, well, that's because black people commit more crimes. So let's look at drugs. A big driver, if you look at Cook County Jail, the vast majority of people that get locked up in Cook County Jail every year are there for drugs. Marijuana. Who uses the most marijuana? White people. Well, how about cocaine? White people. Many more people. White people use cocaine. All right, crack. All right? If you read on the papers, you're sure that crack is only used by poor people from the black urban communities. Nope. It's white people. More white people use crack than black people. Doesn't matter if you're talking about ever used it, used it within the last year, used it in the last month. A lot more white people use crack than do black people. But who do we lock up for drugs? Black people. The blue line, the dark blue lines on this slide, that's who uses drugs. So about 70% of drug users are white because it's about 70% of the population. About 15, 12 to 15% 15 of the of the drug users are black. Again, because that's the percentage in their population. Everybody in the population, black, white, rich, poor, uses drugs at about the same rate. But the light blue lines on this slide, that's who we lock up for use of drugs. And although blacks only account for about 12% of drug users, they account for over 40% of the people that we lock up for using drugs. So who we send to prison is not related to whether who commits the crimes, at least when you look at drugs. It's related to where we look for a crime, 
you find it where you look for it. It depends on who gets punished for using for the crimes that we find, and how long they're punished for. It's a book called Dorm Room Dealers, which looks at the um, drug usage in a Southern California campus, which I'm pretty sure is USC, but allegedly anonymous. <laughs> and what they find is that there's a much higher percentage of drug use on, on at least this college campus than there is in places like public housing developments. And that makes sense, because who's on college campuses? Young people. With money. And they have some money. They may have big student loans, but at least they've got disposable income. Who's in public housing developments? Poor people. Old people and kids and moms, none of whom have any disposable income at all. But where do we put our police resources? In the projects, right? The police resources are not out at Northwestern University trying to do undercover buys, infiltrating the dorm rooms, trying to find out who's dealing drugs on campus. That's not what they do. They go out to the west side of Chicago. They go out to the south side of Chicago to try to get people to sell them drugs or to buy drugs. If we put the same sorts of resources into college campuses as we put into public housing developments, the prison system would be full of middle class white people. And we would not have a prison system that looks like it does. So again, who we lock up has less to do with who commits crimes and more to do with where we look for them and what we do with them when we find them. At every stage of the criminal justice system, black people are overrepresented. Whether it be arrests, once you're arrested, if you're charged, once you're charged, are you, do you go to trial? If you go to trial, are you found guilty? If you're found guilty, you're going to go to prison. How long you're going to go to prison, when you're paroled, and whether you're violated on parole. At every single one of those steps, blacks are vastly overrepresented. Every one of them. So what does this mass incarceration mean in Illinois? In Illinois, it means we have a prison system which was designed, and I use the design in big quotes, and I'll explain why in a minute, for 32,000 people. But that's really just talking about beds. If you look at things like classroom space, the number of doctors, the number of mental health professionals, the number of drug treatment programs, even things like yards, common areas for people to sit and play cards, people to watch TV, vocational training, jobs, it's more like a system designed for 20 to 25,000 people. But whichever, way, whichever version of design you talk about, we in fact have over 40,000 people stuff in this system in Illinois. It makes it one of the most overcrowded, underfunded, and understaffed prison systems in the entire country. We are in hot competition with places like Alabama, Louisiana, and Oklahoma for the title of the worst prison system in the country. About five years ago, we were the 50th among 50 states in how little we spent on medical care for our prisoners. We've now clawed our way up because of two lawsuits we filed to about 43rd. But we're still way down at the bottom of the pile. And it's not just by a little bit. If you look at California, and California is the one that about three years ago, the United States Supreme Court said that their prison system was so bad in terms of medical care and mental health care that the only solution was to send people home. California spends over five times as much as we do. Five times as much as we do on medical care. We get exactly what we pay for. Where do all these people live? In tiny little cells. This is Menard Correctional Center way down in Southern Illinois. It was finished in 1920. It was started before the Civil War. <coughs> These cells were originally designed for one person. When they got crowded in the 70s and 80s, we just put a second bunk in there. These are two guys living in, in a one-person cell. As you can see, there's room for both people to stand up, but they both can't really move around very much in those cells. Those two cells are kind of nice because they've got open bars. It's not until you go into a prison and you look at one of these galleries here, like this one, and you see there are 50 cells in front of you and five stories high. 
of these little tiny cages piled on top of each other. So you're talking about 250 cages on just one half of one building that you can see all at once. 500 individuals just in that one little area that you under, begin to get an understanding of what mass incarceration is. It means that we are putting masses of people in tiny little cages and leaving them there to rot away. Some of those places actually don't have bars in their cells anymore. The bars in the cells are the nice ones. This is Pontiac, also finished in about 1920. They replaced all those steel doors with all those nice bar doors with solid steel doors. The only ventilation in those, there's no windows in these cells. Do you remember from back here, there's no window. The only ventilation they get is through those tiny little slots on the bottom of the door. Oh, heck no, there's no air conditioning in any prison in Illinois. Those little slots behind at the bottom used to be enough for a little bit of air to get in. But they're now decades old. They've been filled with dust and grease and not cleaned and then painted over so that the holes that started off like that are now like that. We get stories of people who are asthmatic in these cells who spend their days lying on the floor with their nose next to the bottom so they can get some fresh air. It's another view of a cell in Menard. Again, you get an idea of just how tiny it is. Also notice there's no ladder to get the second bunk. So that means that people have to, this thing you see in the back there is a toilet sink combination. You step on the toilet, you climb on the sink, and then you climb up to your bed. That's the only way to get up there. If you're young and agile, like I used to be, you might be able to boost yourself up there. But these days, I'd have a hard time climbing up even on the sink and the, and the toilet combination. Also think about where your head goes. If you're on that bottom bunk, you have two choices. You can put your head towards us, the front of the picture, but what's there is open bars. So that means anybody walking down the gallery can hit you on the head and you'll never see them coming. All right, so I, I'm gonna spin around and put my head at the other end. Well, then my head's a whole three inches from the toilet. Those are your two choices living in a cell like that. Neither of them are very good choices. Another view of a similar cell, also at Menard. Gives you another idea of just how tiny these cells are. The bed takes up more than half the width of the cell. In these cells, you cannot stand with both your fingers out. It's an elbow and a finger. <coughs> That's how wide those cells are. Bernard Simile has covered up a lot of those cells with these solid steel doors. This one, you notice, has this padlock on the outside of the door. That's because this is a crime scene. One of the cellmates killed the other. There was a period of about six months where there were five of those murders at Menard, where one cellmate was killed another. It turns out, to the surprise of absolutely nobody who thought about it, that locking two people in one of these tiny little rooms alone, 24 hours a day, is actually not very healthy. It drives people crazy, quite literally. Another view of what it looks like to stack these things on top of each other. That Stateville Correctional Center down the road here in Joliet, an hour away from here. So how did we get here? How in the world did this happen? As a lawyer, there are a whole bunch of sort of technical things that happen. The Rockefeller drug laws are pretty commonly known when Governor Rockefeller had said we're going to lock people up for a really long time. California got rid of, in, of determinate sentencing. You used to be able to get parole after a couple years in prison. You can't do that anymore. Then the whole rest of the country followed, followed suit. Uh, Reagan announced zero tolerance for drugs. Uh, it was the beginning of those egg cracking commercials that everybody's ever seen. Um, it started off as a treatment program, but quickly turned into a incarceration program. Uh, there were fed, the federal government that came with mandatory minimums. So if you got caught even for a relatively small amount of drugs, you spent a decade in prison. Good time was eliminated in lots of systems. So those are all sort of the technical legal answers. But I'm more interested in, politically, how did we end up with all these things getting passed? It's not like Congress just came in and did it. We've all heard the stuff about Biden, how he voted in favor of the, of the uh, Crime Act in, in 1994. Biden was hardly alone in that. Uh, what we don't hear a lot about is that a lot of the Black Caucus also voted in favor of that root law. There was real demand in the, in the late 70s, starting in the late 70s and peaking in the 90s, to crack down, lock people up. That's the solution we have. So how did that happen? I, I suggest that there was a series of events in the 70s 
which was a reaction to the civil rights movement, which re was a reaction to the freedom that people were gaining for themselves in this country. And what we see in mass imprisonment is a, is a direct reaction to what happened. And it's a series of things that happened right in the period, but right before that curve shot higher and higher. 1964, uprising in LA. Everybody knows about the Watts riots. What most people don't know is it was started off when police beat up a motorist. Typical stop, young black man, they beat the crap out of him. That's what caused that riot. Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968. Big parts of the west side of Chicago were looted, were burned down. It hasn't recovered yet. If you go out to the west side, you'll see it's no longer packed full of buildings. It's now lots and lots of vacant lots all over the west side of Chicago. Yep. Big chunks of it burned during those protests against King being assassinated. Later in the same year, we had the 1968 Democratic Convention here in Chicago. Very violent. Lots of protesters, lots of people got injured. It's right down in Grant Park. Kent State, 1974, I think. 70, 70, 70, somewhere in there. Sorry, I forgot the date. National Guard killed peaceful protesters against the Vietnam War. Just a couple months later, 1970 was Jackson. Uh, a couple months later, exactly the same thing happened in Jackson State. We don't hear about it in Jackson State because, of course, the protesters there were black, not white, so it didn't get the same coverage. But exactly the same thing. You had uh, students at Jackson State University, a, a historically black college, who were protesting against the Vietnam War and, again, were shot down by the National Guard. Is that Mississippi? Jackson State is in Mississippi, yes. Jackson, Mississippi. 1970. Two, I think, is Attica. 1971. Thank you. 1971 was Attica, uh, where prisoners took over one yard after about four days. Governor Rockefeller decided that he had to take it back over again. Came in with the National Guard, with prisoners, with sheriffs, with county officials, everybody who they could hold a gun, um, and took that back again. Uh, the excuse given at the time was that the hostages that the, that the prisoners had taken were being abused, were being killed. Uh, they, there was a press conference saying that some of those hostages had their throats slit. There even were allegations that some of the hostages had been emasculated by mm -hmm. the prisoners. So they came in using extreme violence. Mm -hmm. sure. Wounded knee a year or so later. Uh, the American Indian Movement took over a town in, nor in uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, somewhere in the coast. Um, and again, uh, several people died. Uh, Leonard Peltier is still in prison today um, due to deaths related to the Wounded Knee protests. What we know today is that every one of those incidents, what most of the violence was done by a representative of the state. Every one. In the 1968 riots here, Mayor Daley gave his famous order to shoot to kill looters. We know most about that. Of course, the 1968 convention, everybody knows that it was a police riot, not, not the protesters rioting. It was the police that were rioting. Attica, we know more than most about, thanks to Heather Thompson, who wrote a book called Blood in the Water. If you haven't read it, I highly suggest it. What we know there is that all of those statements about the guards being attacked were false. There had been no injuries whatsoever to any of the guards that were taken hostage. All of the all of the deaths, and there were I think 19 of them, were caused by the military taking back over again. They were all shot, every single one. Of them. What we also know is that before the takeover, it was carefully coordinated what the media strategy would be. Governor Rockefeller, in his pool house, held a meeting, which included representatives of the state police, the corrections people, the state attorneys. Uh, the Attorney General of New York <coughs> talking about how are, how are we going to spin this? What are we going to? What's the line going to be? And that's how you, where they came up with this idea uh, as to who was uh, about emasculating and slitting throats and all that. And that they also agreed that the first thing they would do after they took it over again is you, you've seen on you've all, everybody seen Law and Order where they go around with the pictures and they put the little markers by each bullet and they figure out what the, and they run the ballistics test and all that. That's not what happened in Attica. 
What happened at Attica was they brought in a bulldozer and bulldozed all the evidence and buried it behind the prison. It's the first thing they did. Bulldozed all the evidence so nobody would ever know which bullets were shot by which rifles. In fact, when they handed the rifles out to everybody, nobody kept track of which got, who got what rifle. So there's no way to track bullets, even if they kept them, to particular rifles at all. We know that the state police even went so far as to go around to coroner's offices and funeral directors to get them to change the death certificates to say that they slit, they died from slit throats instead of from bullet wounds. Luckily, the coroner who did most of his autopsies was a stand-up guy, held a press conference, showed those x-rays, which were very clear bullet holes of what killed these guys. We also know that this was not just Rockefeller. You may recall there was some discussion there about Rockefeller becoming vice president or president, which was on a trajectory to try, to try to get national office. Nixon was aware of this. This went through the FBI all after the White House. And we know about that because Nixon did us the favor of tape recording all of his conversations in the Oval Office. So there's a tape out there of him talking to Rockefeller and asking, you know, what's this all about? Who's behind this? And Rockefeller is saying, oh, this is the blacks. This is the radical blacks that have taken over. They're the ones doing this, even though it was a multicultural coalition. Nixon said, well, if that's true, then you're fine. Don't worry about it. Go in there with force. And that's exactly what he did. They spun this as not that prison conditions were so bad at Attica that people were willing to risk their lives to try to improve what their, their situation. Instead, they spun it as we have animals that are locked up in here who need to be locked up forever. We have people that are on the streets that are rioting, that are tearing apart our cities. We need to lock them up. That was the message that came out of the 60s. You would think that from those series of events, the message that would come out would be we need a tighter control on the police. We, have, we need to reduce the violence by the state. But that's not the narrative that won. The narrative that won was we have evil criminals. They're not like you and me. They're black. They're young. They're radicals. We need to do something about it. And that something was locking people away. And that's how we ended up with what we got today. That was the impetus to, to start that skyrocketing that you saw in the mid-70s. I need to say that is not the only way to run a prison system. It just isn't. People think in the United States this has been here forever, and this is the way to do things. It's not. 20 years ago, Norway had the exact same kind of system we do. And they said, this is not working. So now this is what a Norwegian prison cell looks like. It looks like an IKEA showroom or maybe a pretty nice dorm room. Norway has an entirely different version of what causes crime and what this is about than we do. In Norway, the philosophy is that what actually keeps us safe is strong community ties. If you look at a family, the reason your kids, hopefully, behave is not because they're afraid of getting beaten or locked in the closet. They behave because they're part of a loving family. And Norway's theory is that's the same thing that happens in society. That if you're close to your neighbors, you have strong community institutions like schools, churches, park districts, after school programs, all the things that make a neighborhood a neighborhood, then people will, will behave because they understand that they're part of a community, that the people they hurt are their friends, are their neighbors. So when people violate the law in Norway, the theory is that those ties have broken down. And therefore, the job of prisons is to rebuild those ties. So you have short sentences in Norway. Five years is considered a really long sentence in Norway. Really long. The prisons are not these huge, big monstrosities in the middle of nowhere like they are in Illinois. They're small institutions, 20, 30 beds, and they're located in neighborhoods. You're not locked in your cell all day long. First, they start in the prison itself. You do things like the prisoners prepare the meals together. Again, to build the idea, you have to cooperate with people in order to live. They're required not to have jobs, but not like making license plates or sweeping the floor or the kind of stupid things we have in Illinois. A job out in the community. You go to work every day. You come back to the prison to sleep. Prison visits are not like you drive 200 miles to a prison and get to see somebody through glass talking on a phone. Prison visits, you go home on the weekend. And you come back on Monday. 
The whole idea is you're rebuilding your ties to the community so that after a year or two, at the very longest, you're ready to go home. And by the time you go home, you have those connections. You can walk right out of prison into a community. There's some really bad people in Norway, though. You may remember, about a decade ago now, um, there was a fascist who walked into a prison, into a uh, kid camp in Norway and murdered 72 children in order to make sure that he would bring attention to the uh, his own Nazi ideology. He thought that the problem in Norway was we're getting too many immigrants. So he got publicity for his position. He got sentenced to 20 years, which is the longest sentence you can get in Norway. 20 years. Yeah. Illinois, the shortest sentence you can get for murder is 20 years. So this is what, in Norway, it's 20 years for 72 murders of, of children. They put him in solitary because they didn't want him to infect everybody else. It's not as nice as the other one, I, I grant it, but it ain't Menard. This is a pretty crappy dorm room, right? Not a nice dorm room like that. This is a crappy dorm room. Has his own desk, he has his own bed, his own shower and, and toilet in the room. So he sued. <laughs> <coughs> and he won. The European Court of Human Rights held that even a gilded cage is still a cage and that one of people's basic human needs is to be with other people and therefore totally icing someone is torture whether it's a really nice isolation or a really crappy isolation it's the isolation that violates your human rights so now even this man gets out of his cell every day to mingle with other people for a while because that's what they believe is what the, the whole system is about, is building those relationships. <coughs> An expert we're working with in a case talked about his trip to Norway. Norway is very proud of their system. They bring people from the United States over all the time to talk about it. So he's touring the prison, and there's a bunch of trees there. And one of the U.S. prison officials along with him says, well, aren't these trees like a serious security problem? And the Norwegian official's like, uh, why? It's a tree. <laughs> so the United States guy thinks for a minute and says, well, <coughs> what would you do if somebody climbed the tree? And the Norwegian official's like, well, I'm not sure why anybody would want to climb a tree. But I suppose if they did, we'd wait for them to come back down. <laughs> Where's the security problem? They're sitting in a tree. They're not going anywhere. In the United States, they'd be out with tasers. They'd probably cut down the tree because the whole purpose of the United States prison, the whole philosophy of our prison system, is punishment. So if you violate a rule, there has to be a consequence. There has to be punishment. That's a very different philosophy. There's good studies coming out now showing that, in fact, we have now taken so many people out of certain communities. Remember, this goes back to where I started, that this experiment mass incarceration is not evenly shared. It's not even evenly shared in the black community. There are a few, literally, blocks in Chicago which account, which, for which we spend a million dollars for block locking people up. The reader ran a, story, a series of stories a couple years ago called Million Dollar Blocks and identified those blocks. So we now pull so many people out of those communities, and of course those are the communities that have the highest crime rates, that we've in fact destroyed those social ties. So we're now locking so many people up that we are making our streets less safe by destroying the ties that actually make us safe. And the best proof of that, there's a couple of, of studies that have now come out, are in a couple of cities now where police have reacted to crackdowns, saying, all right, we're not going to hassle anybody anymore. New York City went through this three, four years ago when they stopped the stop and frisk. Police were like, okay, we're no longer going to stop anybody for anything. We're only going to respond to reports of crime. We're not doing anything else. They figured that the whole city would fall apart. In fact, studies show that the crime rate went down during the period where the police weren't harassing anybody. So more policing has actually made us less safe. Locking people up has actually made us less safe, not more safe. That's, that's the man I was talking about who killed all the kids in Norway. So my hope is that 50 years from now, People, or 100 years from now, people look back at us and say, what the heck were those people thinking? 
that this mountain that we built will turn into a, a, a blip historically, and we'll be back down where we were in the 1970s. We're making a little bit of progress. Clearly, mass incarceration is on the public agenda now. Every one of the Democratic candidates have now put out a, a position paper on reducing mass incarceration. Four years ago, that was not true. It was not talked about at all. Today it is. So we're making progress, but we have a long ways to do. All we've done is start that tiny little top there. You see the little blip at the top. That's where we are. We've reduced the mass incarceration just a little bit. We have a long ways to go to get back to 1970. And what people forget is in 1970, there was a real debate in this country <coughs> saying that we locked up too many people, that we needed to lock up fewer people, and that prisons had outlived their usefulness, that we should abolish them and try something else. Instead, we locked up seven times as many people. Thank you. All right. All right. Now it's time for questions. Um, do you need a moderator or do you need somebody to help you? Okay. Okay, I don't know. Well, Karina, would you mind? Okay. All right. Justin, if you want to moderate, come on up. Justin will take care of it tonight. He's uh, Justin behind his hat. I'll ask him a question. Okay. Okay, um, before we get started here, it gets a little exciting during the question and answers. No, I'm an exciting guy. Up here, don't shout in the microphone or don't shout off into where they can hear each other. I got a big voice, I know. Yeah, so anybody right. that's loud, don't, don't shout into that mic. Okay. Who wants, to ask, uh, who wants to ask the first question? I would. Uh, I pointed to uh, Dagny okay. over here. Okay. I have two questions. The first one is, uh, when were the prison uh, system outsourced? And secondly, um, what is happening with uh, people getting out because of the legalization of drugs? Okay, so um, very different questions. Um, Illinois, private prisons are illegal. We don't have any. Nationally, it gets a lot of press, but it's actually a very small part of the problem. Only about 5% of the prisons in the United States are in private prisons. So people talk about the private prisons as being the source of this mass incarceration and how there's a profit motive behind it. I disagree with that. I want to say that the, the, the source of it is political, not economic. That we do this because we're afraid of freedom. Because the people in charge don't want to give up their power and they push back and they've used the fear of crime to get the rest of us to go along with that. So it's a political problem, not an economic problem. Um, the second half of your question was legalization of marijuana. Well, yeah, all these people that are locked up for 10 years because they're right. going to join. So um, the way the Illinois law is written, which is one of the most progressive in the entire country, um, all of those old convictions, most of those old convictions will be expunged. So people will no longer have records. Uh, it's automatic. Other people who don't fall in that have the right to apply for expungement, but it's not automatic. But most people have a conviction. It'll get wiped out. I don't know if they're going to actually release a few people. Very few people in the Illinois Department of Corrections are there just for possession of marijuana. Um, generally, it's it may be driving while you're intoxicated, for example, or it may be a lot of crimes related to marijuana, or maybe harder drugs, but very few people are there for just marijuana, and they generally have very short sentences. So I don't know if they're going to be released, but most people who are there for possession of drugs, the average, which you have to remember is the average time we spend in the Illinois Department of Corrections is less than a year. That's the average. So it's a huge term. Even though we have these very long sentences, we lock up a huge number of people for very short time. So those simple possession cases are going to get out of the system within a few months anyway. All right, let's go with uh, Karina, Andy, and this gentleman over here. Okay. Uh, if you don't mind the political uh, question here, President Obama pardoned a lot of people who were um, in jail for not. What stopped him from changing any, from, from trying to change the laws? In, in, from I mean, the simple answer is, is Congress. But I think the better question, which is the one I asked at the time, is you say it was a lot, but it wasn't actually a lot. It was less, it was several hundred maybe. But there are, I'm not going to get the number right, but approximately 100,000 people in the, in, the, in the federal system. 
he could have let them all go, the stroke of the pen. I would have been much more impressed if he would let 10,000 out instead of 1,000 out. Maybe it was as many as 1,000. But why didn't he let 10,000 out? And all of them were low-level drug offenders. In order to solve our mass incarceration problem, you've got to go after the violent offenders as well. We, had, we just had extraordinarily long sentences. These people who have 60, 70, 80 year sentences who are going to die in prison now. There's just no excuse for them. As I say, the longest sentence in, in Norway is 20 years. If we just if we just passed a bill, which has been pending in, in Illinois every year, um, saying that once you've done 25 years in prison and you're over 50 years, you're el eligible for parole. Not automatically released, but eligible for parole. We could get rid of an awfully lot of people. But the way we're going now, we're going to end up with a, a, a we're going to be running very large nursing homes, frankly. Uh, people are going to get away very sick. It's going to be very expensive. Hello. Uh, I am Danny. Um, in your research, uh, how uh, have you seen the, the numbers showing that some states are using <coughs> uh, arrest and prison time to give people a record so that they can't vote? That uh, the prison, uh, you know, sentences are being used to change the demographics of who can vote in America. Sure. I mean that's that clearly started. It was explicit right after the Civil War, uh, mostly in the South. So not so much in the North because the North generally people once they have records can still vote. But in the South, starting right after the Civil War, anybody who's convicted of a crime lost their franchise, um, and therefore they went around and picked up lots and lots of people, charged them with vagrancy, um, gave them records, and then they couldn't, it was the excuse not to allow people to vote, black people, obviously. Um, and you still see that today in places like Florida, um, has a huge population which cannot vote, uh, and most of the southern states still have to fill in disfran disenfranchisement rules. So yes, all the time. All right, let's go with uh, this gentleman, Tim, and then David Zucker. How okay. uh, 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 have uh, you seen the situation evolve in Uptown? How has the situation evolved in Uptown? Yes. <laughs> well, Uptown itself has changed dramatically. Um, not talking about prisons for the moment, but uh, <coughs> when I moved to Uptown in 1978, it was a majority poor community. Uh, most of those poor people lived in uh, private housing, and uh, it was ethnically, racially, economically <coughs> diverse. The diversity remains today. We still have one of the most diverse neighborhoods in the entire country. The income level, however, has changed dramatically. Um, the only people, there's still lots of poor people left in uptown, but all of them are living in subsidized housing. The number of privately owned, low cost housing <laughs> in uptown is almost none. And the reason there's enough poor, low-income housing there, so there's still a, poor, a large poor population, is because people, including but by no means mainly me, fought for 30 years to ensure that they would maintain a place for poor people in Uptown. We were the one community that was racially integrated and wanted low-income housing, so the city put a lot of it here. All right, let's go with Tim, David, and then George. Actually, okay, I would sorry, just, can I say one more thing about the last Tim? question? No, I didn't. Uh, which is, we also, and this really goes back to your question in the back. What we see a lot of in Uptown is police officers picking up kids who live in public housing for a single joint. They don't go to court, they don't try to prosecute, but they report that to CHA. And what people don't realize is that if your child is in possession of drugs, the entire family can be evicted. So the police actually are quite smart and they realize that Eviction is a much bigger penalty than it would be to go to jail for overnight, which is what's going to happen if you get drugs, if you get a marijuana possession. So they are picking people up to get them out of the neighborhood. Okay. I have a question. All have right. It. Now, I just want to find out why you got into the, give us a little bit about your personal background and why you got into this organization in the first place. Uh, well, okay. So I got into the organization because um, I, when I moved to Chicago, I moved here to go to law school. Um, my wife and I knew exactly one person in the city of Chicago, and they lived in uptown, so we looked for an apartment near them, and I literally walked by the front door of the law center every morning to get on the L to go down to school. Um, at the end of my first year, I said, I've got to do something other than continue to go to law school for the next two years, or I'll go insane. Um, so I knocked on the door and said, do you need any help? And the answer was yes. Uh, but the, l let me finish that question. Um, but the, my background as to why I found that attractive, um, I grew up in Baltimore. Um, my mom was very active in the civil rights movement. Um, originally, through things like housing discrimination, she did sit-ins, 
I was active with the Congress for Racial Equality um, during my childhood. And then as I became a teenager, she got involved in the prison movement, as a lot of people from the Civil Rights Movement did, because they locked a lot of people up from the Civil Rights Movement. Um, so I, got, I actually made my first prison visit back in high school um, with my mom. And sort of once you find what prisons are really like, at least for me, it was like, I can't live in a world that does this to people without trying to do something about it. Okay. So those are the skills I have. Other people do other things about prisons, but my skill is as a litigator, so this is how I chose to do my life. Thank you. All right, David Zucker, George, and this is woman right here. Okay, I have two quick questions. Uh, first of all, yes, Chief, you have two questions. <laughs> hasn't Florida changed their law re recently to permit the franchise, restore the franchise to people who've been imprisoned? And two, during when you first got started in Uptown, did you run across the trail of a public interest lawyer by the name of Marshall Patton? Um, I don't remember that name at all. It doesn't mean he wasn't there, but I was just a kid at the time. Okay. So there are a lot of people I didn't know. I've met anyone in law school. Um, uh, yes, Florida did change its law. However, the election officials then changed the changed law, uh, not by passing new legislation, but passing new rules, which said that yes, you're no longer disenfranchised, but if you owe the state any money, then you can't register to vote. And uh, what happens to a lot of people is they go to prison. For example, their child support payments continue. Um, they don't ever go in, and of course they have no income, and they don't go to court to change their child support because they're in prison, figuring it stop. Or they had parking tickets which didn't get paid, which now have multiplied because they get paid for decades. Um, and they come out of prison owing thousands and thousands of dollars, and there's no way to pay it off. So effectively, it has only re-enfranchised many fewer people than the legislators intended. It was subverted. All right, George. Okay. Um, lately, there's been a, a lot of robberies and assaults and stealing of the Gold Coast people, the wealthy people on the Gold Coast, by blacks, young blacks, attacking whites on the Gold Coast. Now, Kim Fox, Attorney General, she says she's not going to prosecute anyone who steals less than $1,000 because she doesn't want to give these young kids a police record. Do you think that's right? Okay, well, first of all, uh, let me challenge your factual assumption here. Um, I don't think the crime rate has gone up significantly at all. I think what's gone up is they the got, press they got rates. five police on each corner. Why are they there? Let him answer the question. Oh, shut up. I'm not talking One to you. One fool, guys. Wait, 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 wait. You asked him yeah, to I think that, as I said, I believe that the press and the public perception of danger has vastly increased. I don't think the actual crime rate has. But your question doesn't depend on that. Your question is whether or not, whatever the rate is, whether or not it's right not to prosecute. And the answer is yes. I don't believe in putting people in prison for much of anything, but certainly not for those sorts of minor robberies. Doesn't mean I don't think there should be a consequence. I think the idea that we have in our minds that the only way to impose a consequence on people is prison is short-sighted and false. There are lots of other ways that we can do, lots of other things we can do for people. Ken Fox has not said, she's going to let them go scot free what she said is she's not going to give them a felony record she's, what she's done is drop the minimum not that they're not going to get prosecuted but they're not going to charge with felonies they can still do community service they can still go to boot camps they can still do lots of things that don't involve going to prison do you think there should be 500 of them on the street on michigan all right here you got your no. question okay, i don't think anybody should be robbing anybody let's go uh, these three ladies how how is the non when if one is going to be legalized in January, how would that affect us? It means you can use marijuana without worrying about getting arrested. That's really simple. <laughs> no, I'm just saying. With the prison. prison population. Oh, it's, I mean, it's not going to have a big effect on the prison population. It'll have a, an effect on the jail population. But most people don't go to prison for simple possession of marijuana. And that's all that's been legalized. And you have to buy it from the right place and all that. So. I don't think it's going to have a big drop in our prison population. It will have some effect. It may go down 5%, but it's not going to be a huge impact. Okay. Um, I'm interested in knowing whether any states in the United States are using more experimental, humane approaches, and also what you think would have to happen uh, to ease into something like the Norwegian way, because I doubt that you can just go from one to the other. 
Um, yes, there are states. Um, oddly enough, North Dakota, not what most people think of as a progressive state, um, is probably further along than anybody else trying out the Norwegian model. Um, the director of their prison system was one of those people who toured Norway and said, hey, this is working and it costs just, a, it doesn't cost a lot more uh, and it's way more humane. Let's try it. Um, not at all their prisons, but they've taken two or three prisons and said, let's try an experiment here. So, and New York State is also trying some creative things. They've gotten rid of the Rockefeller drug laws. Um, New York State now has the problem I wish everybody had, which was what to do with empty prisons. Um, they've got three empty prisons trying to figure out what the heck they're going to do with these huge, big edifices, which they don't know what to do with. They're Airbnb. designed as prisons, right? Well, yeah, I mean, maybe, but, <laughs> uh, you know, they, stay, they turned Eastern State Pennsylvania, Eastern State Prison in Philadelphia into a museum about uh, mass incarceration. That seemed like a good idea. Um, right here in Illinois, we have also the old Joliet Prison, which is sitting here empty and falling apart. Uh, they're trying to make it into a Blues Brothers tourist attraction uh, because that's where it was filmed. Uh, but not too many people are interested in investing in that, so it's just their empty. Uh, let's go Ellen Corley, Raj, and Ellen Harrow. <coughs> I've got a bunch of questions, but... Um, oh, my goodness. You're, you're <laughs> well, better cheated than everybody else. <laughs> I, I'm probably... Maybe we'll come back around. But one... I know my friend Eugene Horton, who I brought over Genie here. Boy. He's Genie Boy. He said to say hi to you. Um, Thank you. We're, we've opened a law office down on 110th yes. Street. I and um, doing great stuff. Yeah, well, we want to do more. And I guess so that's one question is... You know, what can we do? How can we organize? Uh, you know, because I know there's law, you know, National Lawyers Guild, or um, uh -huh. but we're also trying to push legislation. Um, I think specifically regarding torture, expanding the torture. Um, How do you organize against? Yeah, so so you know, he could just. It's frustrating that very little. It's hard to organize as an activist uh, to make significant change but and specifically regarding torture I mean, i've heard one third of people may be innocent because of these systematic plea deals i don't know and the question but, is okay what? but one thing also human rights perspective one i heard a guy say he was in the black dark for a year or over a year so it's not only solitary confinement how can we get human rights laws brought into this situation you can't. Um, the, the United States Supreme Court has been uh, loath to cite any international law and it's essentially written it out of our Constitution despite what the Constitution actually says. Um, I think the answer to your question, though, is is in your question, that is organizing. I think the only solution to this is changing the hearts and minds of the public. That's why I'm here tonight. Uh, people like Eugene Horton become the best spokesman uh, when people get out and see this human being. I, they say, hey, gee, this really shouldn't, this guy didn't need to spend 40 years in prison. 48. Sorry? <laughs> didn't, mean to, didn't mean to short. short. 10 and um, solitary. Right. I mean, I work with uh, Brian, who spent 28 eight years in prison, 23 of them in solitary. And um, I, I will never forget, shortly after he got out, he got out of this maximum security prison, TAMS Correctional Center, thankfully closed now. Um, Thanks to you among others. Uh, again, I'm not going to take total credit for that. Uh, and he was talking to somebody at one at a big lawyer event, and this lawyer was defending the Supermax, saying, oh, no, the only people who go there are the really terrible people, and um, you know nobody ever goes there is ever going to get out. And, and Brian just let him talk for like five minutes. He said, two months ago, I was in Tampa. And the guy says, but you're normal. And Brian says, well, so is everybody else there. And that's the most powerful testimony you can have. So people like Eugene, people like Brian, have been beginning to build a network of former prisoners who are willing to talk. And you know, it's it's not easy because people do come out severely traumatized. And every time they give a talk like this, it re-traumatizes them. So you know, I don't want to demand that people talk like that, but they are the best, even if it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And part of the problem we have is that people want to hide the fact that they have somebody in their family who's in prison. People want to hide the fact that they were in prison because there's such a stigma against them. But if people got out and said, yeah, I spent a year in prison, you know, I'm not bad. Bobby Rush, congressman from the South Side, when we were organizing around the C numbers, the old guys who were, are still eligible for parole, he would say, I'm a C number. He spent time in prison, got a C number, and now he's a congressman. So, you know, you have to identify, you have to say, I'm a normal person. Okay. All right, let's go Raj, Ellen, and then Charlie. Uh, what have you done in your organization that has made a difference? That, that you can take to a market and say, hey. Sure. So I answer that two ways. One is, 
um, we file a lot of cases on individuals. And many of them don't win. Um, but the very fact that they are able to get a forum, a voice, and as one of the prisoners told me when I felt really bad that I'd lost his case, this is the most amazing thing that's happened to me since I've been in prison. There was a prison guard up there who had to answer your questions, just like I did. And that never happens in prison. Guards never have to answer me at anything. So to make him stand up there was amazing to me. So the very fact that somebody's willing to fight and, and fight for these guys means a lot. But the, bigger, the other answer is, we now have seven class action cases against the Illinois Department of Corrections. Um, they have begun to change the way medical care and mental health care are provided in the department. Both of those are going to be real struggles, um, but there are changes. We've now got the old Joliet uh, juvenile prison has been repurposed into a mental health facility. It's the best one in the state. That's because of our case. Right next door, they are building a mental health hospital. For the first time, Illinois will have some place to put the most serious mental health in a hospital instead of throwing them in solitary, which has been our practice so far. We also have ones about excessive use of solitary, so we are trying to get the courts to reduce the amount of solitary. Even simple things like hearing aids, uh, uh, ASL interpreters for people who are deaf, Illinois didn't used to provide them. Now they do because we sued them. So what do we do? Aside from our talking like this, is we bring lawsuits. That's what we're in the business of doing. We hope that the courts will intervene in some of these cases, and we hope that the, that the lawsuits themselves will bring exposure to the rest of the country, to the rest of the state, as to what's going on. It's a platform. All right, uh, Ellen, Charlie, and then we'll do another round of questions after, and then Jonathan, and then we'll do another round of questions. I, I suppose I really had the same kind of question as the other Ellen. Well, she had a whole bunch, so you What can the average person do? What, what, can, what can we do to try to um, help with this situation, to try to help um, decrease or end solitary and help decrease these? Yeah. I mean, talk to your neighbors. Really and truly talk to your neighbors. Talk to your legislator. Because one of the things that everybody's told when you go down to Springfield is nobody has ever lost an election in Illinois because they're too tough on crime. But people lose elections all the time because they're too soft on crime. Nobody ever calls us and says we're being too harsh on crime. Everybody calls us and says you've got to do something. You've got to lock up more people. So if you make those calls, the next time I go down to talk to a legislature, say, oh, yeah, somebody from my district called and said you've got to do something about this. So even if they say no or blow you off or whatever, it's important to hear from you. Call them, write them, whatever it can be. Obviously, if you can, if you're an organizer and you can organize protests, great, you can do that. Um, on a more sort of individualized level, um, one of my favorite programs is Chicago Books to Women in Prison, um, located right here in Chicago. They send out 13,000 books last year to women in prison, um, and books are a lifeline to the outside. So you can donate books to them, you can volunteer to pack those books, you can donate money so they can pay postage. Um, it's a great organization. They're over on uh, Hermitage up in Uptown. Uh, so okay. go the they've got a great website, and you can volunteer or donate. All right, next. All right, uh, Charlie, Jonathan, and then we'll start another round. Yeah, Alan, what's your opinion? Well, who's opinion? buying this round? Anyway. Uh, the, hey. Hey. You're buying a round? What's your candid opinion of the uh, uh, immigration practices as begun by Sheriff Arpaio and continued by Department of Homeland Security. Well, I am not an expert on immigration, so let me make that really clear. But you asked my personal opinion, so I'll give it to you. We do not do any, any immigration work except that people all the time. So this is me. I think it's disgusting. Uh, that's, that's my opinion. I think it does no good to lock people in cages. I think that just like crime, the only solution is to make where they came from better so that they don't want to come to the United States. And frankly, we're the ones who have destroyed much of Central America's economy um, over the last 50 years. And it's no surprise that people want to leave there. That's the solution to immigration, not walking people away. Right. All right. Jonathan. Stand up, Jonathan, so I can see you. You're way back there in the corner. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so in the last four administrations, the uh, War Powers Act has been violated approximately 50 or 60 times. So uh, how would you, if we actually did appropriately use our courts and our laws and our prisons, see that as an opportunity for some of the cabinet members and presidents uh, to go into our prison system? Uh, I mean, if anybody belongs in prison, most of the people who belong there, but I'm not holding my breath. Uh, that is not the purpose of prisons, is not to lock up 
people in power, it's locked up people who challenge people in power. So it's not going to happen. Exactly. Um, okay. All right, let's go George, Tim, and Raj. Okay. J January 1st, they're legalizing recreational marijuana. Yes. Uh, don't you think there'll be a lot more potheads? By potheads, I mean people who lose their motivation, especially adolescents. Yeah, also, confused people and uh, bad drivers. Uh, don't, don't you think that's true? It, it's bad for the, yeah, the city, well, I think. Of course, they're going to get uh, tax money on this, but... Uh, I would say no. The vast majority of people who use marijuana right now have no consequences. We lock up a very, as I showed this slide, we lock up a very tiny percentage of people who use marijuana, and it's all young black people. And those are not the ones that are driving out there. You're, what you're going to find is that the rate of use doesn't change dramatically. It may go up a little bit, but not a lot. Um, what's going to happen is you no longer have police out harassing young black men for marijuana. That's what the change is going to be. Okay. Okay. okay, if it's not about, can you comment on the case about the debate team? and the prison. I can, it's my case, or part of it's my case. Okay. Um, so for everybody who doesn't know what he's talking about, um, Illinois does not have parole, despite what you read in the paper. So people get an 80-year sentence, spend 80 years in prison. Um, there has been a move, as I said, for many years to try to change that um, so that people do have a chance to get out after they've served 25 years in prison and they're at least 50 years old. There was a group of men at Stateville, our Correctional Center that's closest to Chicago, um, who had a debate class, and the topic they chose to debate was not whether we should have parole, but what sort of parole system we should have. And the debate was between a clinical model, that is you make an individualized determination for everybody who comes up, versus a uh, actuar actuarial model, that is you use statistical projections to see whether somebody is likely to commit a new crime. So that was the debate. Um, after an entire semester, they invited, they held a public debate, um, invited a bunch of prison officials, some activists from the outside, as well as some legislators. The legislators were frankly amazed, um, both that they were so articulate and that Illinois didn't have a parole system. They didn't know that. A bunch of those legislators asked to talk to the men afterwards, asked to meet with them one-on-one, -on -one, at which point the Illinois Department of Corrections came in and said, nope, we're not letting the legislatures in and we're going to cancel all the class and, no, and barred the teacher not only from teaching anymore, but barred her from visiting any prisoner anywhere in the state of Illinois. Um, there are now two cases pending, one by us on behalf of the teacher, saying it was a retaliation for holding a debate that legislators cared about, and one on behalf of the prisoners, which is done by a friend of mine, um, saying that they were retaliated against and their class was canceled, uh, again, because of what they were saying and because the legislature paid attention. Uh, both those cases are relatively early on. I believe it's a clear First Amendment violation. We have great evidence. Um, I hope we win. Do people have that type of power in prison, though? Should people have that kind of power to debate? No, no, I meant the people who shut it down. Oh, no, no, absolutely not. I mean, look, there's no right to have any particular class, but the right is really clear that you can't, if you're going to grant classes, you can't terminate them because you don't like the viewpoint that's being expressed. That's what the First Amendment is about, is content-based political expression. That's the core First Amendment, and that's what this was. The Department of Corrections did not like the message that the prisoners were giving to the legislatures, and liked even less that the legislatures were paying attention. Um, so they shut it down. That's what the First Amendment is about. So we think it's the strongest possible case you can have without the First Amendment. Okay. Raj, uh, this gentleman back here, then Ellen Corley. Is it free? Is it Are they committing crime they are charging? I mean, some are and some aren't. I don't think there's any difference. I don't think there's any difference in uh, wrongful conviction rates. There, you know, Cook County has the worst uh, wrongful conviction record of any county in the state, in the, in the country. Um, we're number one, thank you, um, in wrongful convictions, or at least in exonerations. Um, partly that's because we have some really good lawyers working on it. Uh, but that has covered blacks, whites, Latinos, <laughs> you name it. They're all been wrongfully convicted. And do you know why it is like that? What? Why it is like that? <laughs> um, because, I, I, again, I go back to politics, um, because the police department was allowed to uh, run roughshod, all they wanted was, all the voters wanted uh, was statistics saying that we're locking people up. Uh, they didn't really care about overall safety. So, if the drive is to get statistics, then you lock up the first guy you can find, who looks kind of like they might be a guilty.
All right, this gentleman, Ellen, and uh, anybody else, and then I'll go with uh, Karina. And then at, at Karina will be our last question. What is it? Can you stand? Should Blago be released from prison? No. <laughs> Blago, Blago, Blago the governor. Be the former governor. Really? I mean, I, you know, look, I, I think that he should be released from prison, but he's way down on my list. Like, you know, if there are 100,000 people in prison, he'd be like my 999,000th one. Um, I don't really care about white, crime, white collar criminals. They're such a tiny little proportion, they can fight for themselves. They don't need my energy. All right, Ellen and then Krita, then we are done with questions. And we'll have one full at a time, please. Come on. Okay, Ellen, go ahead. Yeah, um, if you could comment on um, this. My, you know, I was thinking about the, my sense is that the state has created, you know, police that wrongfully can be because they don't, hold them accountable even when it's obvious that they wrongfully convict and shoot and kill they yeah. um you know yeah. it's uh, created a monster and i mean how can we get those laws changed you know so that nothing you don't need to change laws you need to change the motivation to enforce them there's not lying on the stand has been a crime forever so yeah. it's, it's not that the law is the problem the problem is that the public doesn't demand accountability the same thing is true in prison Prison guards who beat up prisoners get promoted rather than fired. Police officers who get wrongful convictions get promoted because they have really good statistics rather than fired. Police officers who are found to have lied under oath get promoted. They become judges. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> See, that's what my theory is. I mean, we have this case, right? We have it. one of the bird torture victims uh, filed a wrongful conviction action went for a judge and it turned out the judge was the same state attorney who sat in the police district and said yes this is a voluntary conviction and of course he found he acted totally appropriate thank you dear all right uh we'll find out who you're voting for when you vote for judges right. we'll go with karina and then we'll move on to the balls okay um i wanted to ask about two politicians kamala uh one was lori lightfoot and is she uh, potentially going to change anything, and then also. Um, <laughs> My crystal ball is broken. She says she is. She hasn't yet. We'll no. see. Okay, and then uh, Kamala Harris. Do you? I know she's in California. She was in California. I can tell you that she did horrible things in California yeah. by criminalizing uh, uh, kids who didn't go to school. Um, she says she's abandoned that, but if you read her platform, it's all words and nothing that she has in her platform will actually reduce mass incarceration, so I'm not hot on Camila at all. Thank she you. withheld evidence. Yeah, evidence. and a bunch of wrongful convictions mm -hmm. and all that. She, she locked up kids for being truant? Yes. She criminalized truancy. All right. Uh, and may have been her parents rather than one person who one person said this was the last question and then uh you got more people with their hands up we got time huh? we got we want to start uh doing our rebuttals at about maybe we can take a couple more but then let's go to rebuttals. all right we'll do charlie we will do uh george we'll do this gentleman and then we'll be okay done george do you're on think, Alan, some of the prison issues will disappear as our society moves away from free market capitalism towards democratic socialism? Yes. Okay. I'm next. Yes. What, what, well, what, I've got a little speech problem. Is it true that uh, the, the reason lawyers tell their, their clients not to talk, to keep silent, is so that you Lawyers can make up a story for them. Yeah. Make up some kind of story that's to true. get them off. That's a lie. Yeah. That's a lie. Well, yeah, he knows. It's it's really simple. There's no advantage to talking. This that's the problem with the adversarial system. That's the problem with the McKinnon system. The motivation throughout the criminal process is deny, 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 and don't say anything. It's the state's burden to prove, so make them prove it. That's the advantage of a system like Norway's, which is more restorative justice, is it gives you an incentive to take responsibility for what you did wrong and try to make it right. 
today, in our system, if you take responsibility and try to make it right, you're, it's a confession and you can go to prison. So you tell people to shut up because that's in their best interest. <laughs> Um, All right, this gentleman uh, who had his hand raised, and then we'll be going to rebuttals. Okay. You're, you're next, sir. Um, wasn't there a California law that says uh, three strikes and you are out? There used to be. They got rid of most of that through a referendum, uh, I think it was about four years ago. But yes, California had the worst of the three strikes laws. The, unlike most states, like Illinois, the third one did not have to be a felony. So you can have two felonies and then a misdemeanor, and you can get life in prison for things like stealing a videotape from a videotape store back when they used to have videotape stores. Can you give me an idea? Why so many governors of Illinois ended up in jail? No. I mean, yeah, because because the voters elected them. That's simple. Okay. All right. All right thank thank our speaker. Good topic. All right. Yeah. Who wants to rebut? About who wants to rebut? Hey, you gotta you finish up. All right, how many people are wanting to rebut? We'll go uh, four minutes each. Um, let's uh, get started with the rebutters. Please, you guys, take your conversations. We're going to start the rebuttals real quick. Let's get up there and get started. Again, we have a four-minute clock. So go ahead and start rebutting, Lomay. And if you want to speak, just get in line. Ready? Hello. Excuse just, just a second, Raj. I'm going to get you ready here in a second. Speaking to the speakers, ignore the camera. Jesus Christ. Okay. All right, we got to turn. All right, Raj, go ahead. My name is Raj Patel. I think. Thank you for thank you, speaker. Norway thing is overplayed. I think. Norway is all white people, and when they are getting the black people there, and they have problem. Okay. And, uh, I was expecting to speak a little bit more about each work and where real problem is and where real solutions are needed. And I think he did not do that. Crime in the black community and uh, by blacks and by ethnic groups is much higher than. It is conveyed. I think it, it, sometimes it's so difficult. This is if you have a little witness on the street, it's so difficult. They make it so difficult. Mm -hmm. But they're always, yes. always a pressure of them trying to come stealing or making trouble. And this thing is real. Okay. What is what is not real is that we have black mayor, black deputy governor, black attorney general. But these guys are not going and talking to black community, hey, not to, don't commit a crime. Because you commit a crime, it's a, it's a bad thing for all black people, all Latino people, because somebody has to tell them, hey, guys, don't do this. And again and again and again and again. Okay? And uh, white people are scared to death. You are walking down the street and uh, there is nobody there, you see a couple of black guys coming. You sure are nervous. Come on, let's be real. You are nervous. It's, I mean, a still, black community, Asian, black and white community do not say it's eye to eye, everything same way. And that is reality. Accept that is reality. And we have to also also teach the minority community that how white people live, how white people make their balance, their budget balance from their salary, how why why. White people raise their kids. What is happening? And whatever they do not understand, then black co black community, black families do everything right. Results are good. They take and educate them. They show them values. They make sure they don't get in trouble. It's working. It's not really not working. And they are going less on a chair. Okay. But uh, this has to be done. And it is a very hard work. And I think mayor has to mayor should go to every week to some area and say, hey, black people, come on, we got to change. We cannot be blamed with the crime and everywhere. We cannot, we should not be killing each other. I mean, as long as you hear the dad killing each other, I think I think it's a chilly thing spread all over. What in the hell is going on? If they don't care, why should we care? Okay, you know, my building is basically white building. And we have black people coming, okay? And do you know something? 
I have lived that building for 30 years. 30 years. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm done, okay? okay? 30 years. And one time I went there, and the four, four black guys sitting in common area, with the drinks there, cards, cards there, and money there. And I went, I got stuck, and I, I just started to walk out. And, uh, and after half an hour, one. But what I'm saying is that there is a certain thing you don't do. Period. And nobody, nobody teaching. It has to, white kids has to be taught to, black kids have to be taught to, Indian kids have to be taught to. We Indian kids we have to talk to it. We don't understand. We don't know how to be how we do that. Okay. You have to learn. Thank you. All right. Next speaker, please. All right. Jonathan, if you're gonna go, go. Who's next? Jonathan, you go? go ahead. First of all, a little more about Attica. The, when they stormed, when they stormed the prison, they, they used a helicopter to drop too plenty of tear gas. Uh, that's number one. Number two, when the correctional officers finally recaptured control of the prison. They had all the prisoners who were still alive stripped, stripped, and made to run a gauntlet of armed guards with clubs. They really wanted to punish these people. Um, the outcry was so great that Governor Rockefeller was appoint, forced to appoint a special commission to look into it. The commission handed down a very critical report, and just before the commission was due to hand down its report, Nelson Rockefeller resigned as governor of the state of New York. Now, granted, he was positioning himself, so he said, and I have no reason to doubt his word, that he was positioning himself for a possible bid for president in the event that Nixon quit right then and there, which was at that time widely rumored, but didn't quite happen then. Um, but I also like to think that he had some advance warning that the commission's report would not be favorable to him. And that may also have played a role in his decision to step down, uh, step down at that particular time. I would also argue that Nelson Rockefeller is not always the liberal person or moderate Republican that has been, that sometimes been said. Number one, there's the Attica. And number two, many years before in the 1930s, when he, before he ever entered politics, Nelson Rockefeller at that time was serving as the chairman of, of some committee connected with his family's new project at Rockefeller Center. And they were about to put in a, they put in a new mural by Diego Rivera called Man of the Universe. Yeah. And Rivera, as he always did, put portraits of like Lenin or whatever in his mural. And this infuriated the Rockefellers, especially Nelson, who paid off Rivera, had the mural covered up, and then they had it chiseled away. We know what it looked like because somebody snuck in there with a camera and took black and white pictures of it before it was chiseled away. And also, Rivera did a virtually identical mural with the same name uh, for the National Autonomous <coughs> University of Mexico. Now, by contrast, at, when the Detroit Institute of Arts opened, um, it had a painting in there for which Betzel Ford had paid. Uh, by Diego Rivera called the Detroit Industry Murals. Again, there were pictures of like Lenin and Marx in there. Again, there was an outcry, but Edsel Ford was not Nelson Rockefeller. He couldn't always be forceful with his father, but he could with everybody else. And what he essentially said was, look, I paid for this mural, I like it, and we're going to keep it. To this day, you can, if you go to the Detroit Institute of Arts, you can still see the Detroit industry murals uh, right up there on the wall. If you want to see Man in the Universe, you need to look at the black and white pictures or you go to Mexico. Okay. So I don't know that he's uh, so liberal. Finally, last but not least, one use they can put State Bill Prison to is they can use it for a bed and breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next please. Ellen, if you're going to go, yeah, go. That's all we need are pictures of communists all over the town. Wait, wait, you put your picture up there, too, Joey. Yeah. Right. I think this oh, is Moscow. You know, I have <clears throat> so many um, 
things I want to say and uh, really more questions to ask, but thank you very much. Uh, um, actually, one question is, uh, how can we, can we volunteer, I want to know, you know, I would love to organize ways. Actually, one of the guys that told me, he was uh, in the dark for several years, I think, works in upstairs from you, is that right, the white guy? Right, yeah. Right, that uh, those stories, I think, are going to make a huge difference. Uh, I made a video last week at, at Eugene Horton's office down on 110th Street. I, we're going to get the word out. That's like going to be a Jane Addams settlement is the vision. I've always wanted to have something like that, and it, it seems to be coming about. Um, you know, they've got a place for movies. We're going to show, uh, um, they showed Malcolm X every Friday afternoon or night. They'll be like raising consciousness, but Malcolm X and the, um, John Marsh, was it John, not John Marsh, the one that did the Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, but the Third Red Marshall. Thing, yeah. Who? Third, Third Red Marshall. Third Red Marshall. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's a great documentary there. A lot of, I was a teacher, and um, I want to get this curriculum into the schools. We have the opportunity to do something for two weeks in the curriculum. Um, that was part of the reparations of the John Burge, and uh, I'd love to get more ideas from you about, you know, we really need to be teaching law in schools. Uh, but one idea I think would be really useful is to um, how, how to, how these people got out of jail. I, right now, I don't think we have the data. You know, um, I mean, you. I'd love to try to get more. I heard you have 10,000 uh, records, um, and I'm a statistical analyst. I, I only lasted in teaching in inner city for, for th three years, uh, but I did get quite a few years in market research and analysis, and I'd love to analyze that and I think we need to sue to get the right to the data because the FOP is actively spending huge amounts of money of our money the city corporation council money to defend thinks its job is to defend the city from liability by continuing to, to pay $550 an hour to the special prosecutors to keep these people in prison this is uh, Robert Milan, and uh, you know we. It's very hard to fight against these guys because the FOP spends money, which is against the law. To um, like the, the reporter, I went up in front of the reporters at the city hall after I saw what a rigged trial they gave to this Mikel Ward, and um, and I, you know, I pointed out the, you know, the lieutenant who was lying. If you look at the record in the Chicago Defender. You know, he had 500,000 or 500 complaints of they've spent this much defending him against all these brutality complaints. And um, luckily, I convinced one reporter from the Tribune, Megan Crepeau, to start writing a more balanced view. And so the, the FOP has a thing called The Watch. They write, you know, liberal activist, Tribune reporter that must be fired is taking a slant against us. I mean, they spend so much money, and this, this was a law in 1913, an executive power, at least at the federal government, it's called the Gillette Amendment, no E, that they cannot do public relations out of the executive office because it leads to abuse of power. Right now, we've got a police state that is abusing its power, and the NGOs, you know, like right now, it's the Thomas More Society, spends money defending dirty cops. Okay, I, I, I met him at my own it. church. So there's so many people we have to push back on uh, through. They've got money, but we've got truth. And only the truth will set us free. Yay! Yay.
How about you're going up there, right? Just going up. So you don't have anything to rebut. Well, no, no, you you affirm. You can affirm. Yeah, yeah, that's that's fine. What we do. Affirm. Talk about whatever you want to talk. Whose purse is this? Oh, that's mine. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, I don't have anything to rebut, but I had a comment. Um, I, uh, I'm, not, I, I'm a big uh, newspaper fan. Uh, there was recently a uh, lawsuit, and it was resolved. Uh, two couples in Virginia uh, said that they wanted to get married, went for a license, and they were told they couldn't apply because the couple said, uh, well, we, won't, we don't want to answer the question about what our race is. In Virginia, they said, no, if you don't answer that question, we're not going to issue you a marriage license. And they sued and they won. So uh, this was a really, really bold rule because on there were, uh, well, for example, there is the term quadroon. And uh, does anybody know what quadroon means? Yes. Sure. <laughs> it means the person had a quarter black blood. One quarter black blood. So there are all these, you know, 200 years ago, 100 years ago with slavery, there are all these terms to differentiate the different types of uh, the percentages of your blood that was uh, allegedly uh, African and, and non-African. And they were still in this law. It's crazy. And, and I read another article, and for the life of me, I just can't remember. I just read it. It was a guy who was arguing that um, we should stop using the word race. You should stop thinking about race. It's not based on any science. It's not. There's, there's no science behind it. If you've got somebody who's got a grandparent who's Chinese, another grandparent who's uh, indigenous Australian, another grandparent who's from South America, well, what race is that? It's not a race. You have all these, his argument is, the problem is that you have these, this incredible gradients of these different, um, uh, uh, these minor differences in physical features. Right. Your shape, difference. your shape, the color, your skin. But genetically, there's no difference. Mm -hmm. There's none at all. Yeah. And it creates all these problems. Yeah. And, uh, and that just really hit home for me, and I just thought it might be worth mentioning, because I know that there are certainly people who uh, are biased in this country. It's a big problem, and uh, and I think it's worth considering. Okay. Yeah. Our next speaker, please. Yeah. Ellen. Um, okay. Hi. Um, I just have a couple of things to say. Um, yeah, I'm definitely a believer in kind of intermediary punishments. Um, I know I did a paper about that in college. How much time do we have, Tim? Four minutes. Okay. You can see I don't the clock. Really have that much to say. Um, you know, I think restorative justice is a really great practice. Um, I one book I read back when I was in college was called Sentencing Matters, and it's all about you know differing punishment levels, um, which are less than going to prison. Um, so that I thought that was a pretty good book. Um, I was curious about, you said that in the state of Florida, if I understood you correctly, you said that um, if these people owe money to the state that they can't register to vote, and that kind of seems like a poll tax. So I, I don't know, uh, maybe I misunderstood you because it doesn't seem like that would be legal, and I'd be surprised if it's not being challenged in the courts, so I was wondering if you could address that. Um, yeah, I, I, the Norwegian model um, is really intriguing, and um, I believe that's something that should really be looked into. Um, I think the idea of community building could be something really useful. I don't think there's enough of that in this country. I also think it would be useful if there were, you know, more like parenting classes offered. Um, you know, just I think that. Some parents are kind of abusive toward their, their children, and that um, can contribute to 
deviant behavior, but um, uh, that's about it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, next, All please. Right. Go ahead. We got time. If you got something to say, it's now is a good time to say it. Well, I think it's a piece of adjunct information on Marnie Glaser. And I'm just going to mention that uh, my cousin, Mead Palodowski, yes. is the artistic director and founder of the uh, Story Catchers Theater, which works with kids who are in detention. Um, like in Bourneville and, uh, and downtown, and uh, she and a team of musicians, actors, um, writers, help the kids tell their story and kind of make a conglomerate story based on their own experiences, and then they make a musical production out of this and perform it um, for sometimes the, the people in the justice system who are related to their cases and uh, one time for parents and I, I've been there before too but it's been a really powerful program for kids to get in touch with what's missing in their lives and the, and the trauma that many of them have experienced. I know I've worked at Rice Child and Family Center uh, as a school psychologist, and many of those kids are super duper, um, well, they're super duper, and they are super duper traumatized and come from abusive situations. So I feel a lot of empathy with um, young people become older people. But I thought I would just mention that to you. Yeah. Okay. Jonathan, you ready? Uh, Please make sure this doesn't disappear. Yeah. Uh, Generally, it's a whole month. This is from 1960 film Spartacus. In the 141st minute of the film, there's a conversation between Forgive me if I can't pronounce this correctly. Tigranus Levantus, is that correct? Does that sound sort of right? And Spartacus? So anyway, this is a conversation they have. May I ask you something? You can ask. Surely you know you're going to lose, don't you? You have no chance. This very moment, six separate groups of soldiers of the Empire are approaching to this position. What are you going to do? We'll decide that when they get here. <laughs> Let me put it to you differently. If you looked into a magic crystal, and you saw your army destroyed and yourself uh, dead, you saw that in the future as I'm sure you're seeing it now, would you continue to fight? Yes. Knowing that you must lose? Knowing we can't. All human beings lose when they die. All human beings die, but a slave and a free human lose different things. They both lose life. A free human dies losing the pleasure of life. A slave loses their pain. Death is the only freedom a slave knows. That's why he or she is not afraid of it. That's why we will win. So, uh, just to reiterate on my question, uh, there are a lot of people who deserve to be in prisons. They're very rich, very powerful, very influential, they have status, they have access, and they think that they're most qualified to be head of state of the most powerful nation in the history of the world. And we're all going to bend over and vote for them next year, right? No. no. 90 million people said no confidence vote. Five million voted for Gary Johnson and Bill Weld, and one million voted for Jill Stein and Ajama Baraka, two proud Chicagoans, by the way, on the Green Party ticket. Who are also wrong. Mm -hmm. Point taken. So what are you going to do, America? What are you going to do, we the people? I don't know. I don't know. In 1775, I know what they did. They said, we're not stupid, 
We're not afraid, and we're not going to be divided from each other. No matter what our political ideologies are, we know that we love the fact that we are free-minded human beings who can make this country a great country in our definition, we the people's definition. So our kids can play on the streets, and at the end of the night, we don't have to worry what trouble they got into. Some cop was playing target practice. Is, my, is that my time done, or can I go to 30 minutes. more seconds? Oh, four minutes. So what I want to see is, at least amongst the College of Complexity uh, attendees, the College of Complexity students, the College of Complexity fans this year, just don't listen to corporate media. Okay, that's the idiot box. They're going to tell you every single day that you're too dumb not to vote for either Joe Biden or Donald Trump. And I hope I am so loud that they can hear me in the parking lot. Because somebody should be loud for once and say, you know what, as a dignified human being who's not a violent person, it's not a bad thing to be loud. They were loud in 1775 in a way that you can't handle Joe and Donald. We're using our brains and our hearts and our souls to be loud. And if we're a little angry and a little aggressive and a little too much for the middle class white folk in the suburbs, well, go to the mall. <laughs> I've had it. There is a person in my family in a prison right now. My mother, who is an operating room nurse for 33 years, and 18 of those years she had multiple sclerosis, because of a ticky-tack Illinois power of attorney law, she's got to be in that institutional warehouse, that senior citizen prison, because people lost their minds. This is America. We can do anything we want to do. We don't have to put people who gave their best to this country in some kind of prison. Mm -hmm. We can fully fund human services so they can stay in their own home and enjoy their retirement, what they've earned. You got that, Homeland Security? Right. I'm looking right in Tim's camera when I'm saying, you got that, Homeland Security? That's where our money should be going, but ain't. So, yeah, okay. that's why we will win. Jonathan Woo! and Ellen in 2020. Yeah. Right, yeah. 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 Run, Do it. I still stand up Thank you very much for this country. I still believe we live in one of the best places on earth, a place where we can speak out where we can, in forums like this, talk about these things. And that the existence of an organization like we have tonight is able to do things such as prison reform. In many other countries in the world, you would not have this freedom of action or self-correcting apparatus, as I'd like to say. We are still a country of laws. We are still a country of countervailing power. We are still a country that if we really want to make change, we can do it. Yes, it may be protesting. Yes, it may be political awareness. But we still have the power of the ballot box. We still have the power of in, in, in action with our citizenry. And we have the power to petition our government. And the thing is, what's nice is that this power does work. The speaker tonight gave several examples of how the, even though we've had a lot of injustice and a lot of political power, the framers of our Constitution were aware of these troubles that could be happen amongst men, particularly against majority rule and mob rule, and they put a system of checks and balances in. I know right now we're having an anomaly president called Trump, but in less than two years, we're going to be able to vote him out of office or continue in, in office, depending on what the electorate wants. We have certain freedoms and certain guarantees that are largely upheld by the courts. Yes, we do have racial injustice. Yes, we do have problems. But in many cases, we've been able to self-correct those troubles. When our country started in 1776, they said all men are created equal. But certainly, that wasn't the case with slavery. We were able, through the bloody Civil War, to finally eliminate slavery and finally emancipate the black population with the Civil Rights Act in the 1960s. And now we're working again to do the same thing with women's rights and some of the other rights that other oppressed minorities have. 
And yes, too, there has been a backlash of it where it's against some of these people. But in our country, at least you have a chance to speak up, to take a look at things. And you know something? I live in the United States. I am proud that our country is here, even though it does have some problems. We usually tend, after a while, to correct those problems. Tonight we're talking about mass incarceration. Yes, it's a problem. But with our speaker is doing something about it and getting rid of some of the gross injustices. If you were in most other countries of the world, you would not even be able to, attach, to touch this stuff without fear of being killed. That is why I really like America, or the United States in particular. We still have that method of self-correction, the right to petition our governments, the Bill of Rights, and as long and it takes, remember what was said, all it takes for evil to flourish is for good men to do nothing. Well, it's time that the good men took back our government, our purse, the power of the purse, the power of the taxes, and their civil rights, and get back to work and make America great again. Thank you. All right, Charlie. All right, Charlie, go ahead. Blast away. Go ahead, Andy. All right, I got it. Uh, for those of you that may not be aware, uh, Naomi Klein is one of the best uh, environmental writers and on social issues in the world. She published a book called This Changes Everything, uh, Capitalism Versus the Climate, I think it was the title of it in uh, 2014. And what these students are striking for all over the world and the adults that are joining them, they're not talking about just solving the climate issue. What they're saying is we can't solve the problem of the deteriorating climate unless we change the way our societies function. And what our speaker talked about tonight, the massive injustice between the, the rich white people at the top and uh, massive incar incarceration of poor people at the bottom for political issues, Greta said it best, and others have said it in various other ways since last August. She says it right to the face of the world leaders where she gives speeches. Just for the last 40 years, you've been violating all kinds of human rights and acting like children to make billions of dollars that you're never going to spend and, and de destroying the environment and the future of the kids in the process. She says, you've all been acting like children, so you left it to us, the kids. That's why we're getting together in large groups of hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands all over the world. The bottom line is, playing by the old rules, playing by the political rules we've got, all we can do is vote every four years, is the most giant crock of bullshit everybody has ever foisted on us. That's what I call, I've used the term cribs, that's short for criminally insane bullshit. It's a giant load of cribs. We're bathed in cribs every day from the media, every single day. And we got what's called no coverage coverage, uh, where uh, the press, the Daily Herald has been doing it for years, something that should have four or five pages in a week coverage. They'll give it a couple lines in a picture, and they say, oh, we covered that. It's no longer important. That's how people come to be ignorant right up until the time something big happens that they should have known about it a month ago so they can plan. This, what happened yesterday with a, a, the student walkouts and the adults, union members, nurses, teachers, it was the biggest climate protest and the biggest, most inspiring thing students have done in the history of students. And what do we got on the front page? A car crash out of Woodfield. Uh, Naomi Klein's book, This Changes Everything, talks about exactly what they do in Norway. It's a different way of looking at society. You don't look at people as being criminals, and all you can do is just wait for them to step out of line and you throw them away for 40 years into a cell. 
they, they think of people as human beings that have basic rights, right to food, clean, clean water, decent shelter. And nor I believe it's Norway. Did you run across it? Norway says when they encounter a homeless person, they find them shelter, safe shelter first, and then they start treating their uh, medical or health problems or mental health problems or anything else. They don't say, uh, you know, we have to treat your mental health first before you can ever find you shelter. It's just the opposite. Sa a safe place to live, decent place to get enough sleep, safe, clean water, food, low stress, decent living conditions should be a basic human right for everybody. And then you start from there. And that's why the Scandinavian countries are miles ahead of us. Because over the last 50 years or so, since 1973, the Canadian uh, John McMurtry wrote a book called Nin uh, The Capital Cancer Stage of Capitalism. He said, if you let billionaire predators get big enough, people with no ethics, no morals, no conscience, they'll get bigger and bigger like sharks, and finally they'll get big enough to just eat everything in sight and destroy a country. And that's what we're seeing in America right now. And the ultimate symbol of somebody masquerading as a leader, somebody with no discernible ethics, morals, and conscience, as those things are understood by ordinary people, we have it in Donald Trump. Wrap it up. And somebody with no ethics, morals, and conscience running the Senate, we have it in Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell. Nancy Pelosi is standing in a blizzard of evidence telling you she can't see a single snowflake. Well, what are we doing, all of us? What is our role? The rest of the world is looking at us. All of us that are old enough to vote or do anything, we're tolerating this. We're complicit in the crimes. And that, that's my message. We can do something about it if we don't just sit back and go to speeches, listen to speeches, and then get on with our lives and go listen to our speech without doing anything. Okay. Yeah. Read some of what the kids are talking about. We'll see you next week. Thank All you. right, next, Charlie. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I guess I'm going to have to kind of bring some character to this issue. All right, Charlie, four minutes. Oh, come on, we're early. No, I get, I get it extra time for waiting. Uh, let's see, I'll be eclectic as usual. Let's begin by thanking our speaker, Alan Mills. Miles, give me a relatively short notice. I'm doing a relatively nice presentation. Please come again. Bring us an update. Uh, in progress here organization. Let's see, my affiliation with crime um, so forth. I was one of the original founders, actually, of the Illinois Coalition Against the Death Penalty. I was the third member, an old nun and a Holocaust survivor. And I was, a, and he succeeded in that. Uh, I also had some experience with a place called the Big Top. Do you know what that is? Uh, Leavenworth. And they call it the Big Top because Kansas is relatively flat, except for the location of Leavenworth Prison, which is seemingly, as you approach it from, it's like a mile, 100 miles away, it's like the land of Oz. <laughs> so they kind of call it, it's a suitable name. Uh, to that location here. Uh, one of the first programs, as a matter of fact, I scheduled at the college many years ago was something called the Racist Imprisonment Binge. And uh, I see by statistics that we're still at it. Not to challenge any of the statistics he gave here tonight, those are pretty, pretty solid, but I know the librarianship that virtually no crime statistics have any validity. Uh, so if you see them, uh, they're cautious. Uh, I, I realize, you know, there's certain calls for reform, judicial system. Um, I, I see you have some dedication to uh, organizations which uh, focus on the police. Uh, are they a perfect uh, 
organist workforce, conceivably not. Uh, it's not a type of work, however, that I personally would perform. And I appreciate what they do. If I'm not willing to do it, I'm not so quick to be critical of them. They do a very dangerous situation and entering situations uh, which uh, we have to, uh, it's, it's a, a sufficient necessary condition. But no, I, 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 I appreciate only those who look at the situation objectively. Um, and the other thing I like to look at regarding crime, or like to look at, and it disturbed me the other day being involvement in public transit, is the fact that I see statistics of crime. And I've been, I was on television, we did a report for CTA on crime on CTA, public transit. Uh, I'm sad to see that it's increased, increasing or so they claim. Obviously, we, we have an organization that tries to encourage transit usage, and the one thing that will deter <coughs> transit usage, of course, if people feel that they are unsafe. People have to feel safer uh, on, when they enter public transit uh, uh, territory than, uh, you know, uh, things. I've also been involved with the uh, Coalition Against Gun Violence which is a serious issue. Uh, I don't have the answer to that. I certainly, where's, no hurry, pal. We're way early. We're Kept that nobody here. It's equal to time. What are you, what are you, no, that's not. Hello. We got enough time here. Um, it's hard to sit so You long. know, uh, the other thing is, the nothing justifies, and the thing that, you know, you, you're talking about reform and what approach we have, but nothing justifies theft or violence, at least in the workplace. Uh, what, what is the cause? I don't have an answer. I've not researched this topic, nor do I think the literature has answers to it. Otherwise, it, we would have done it a long time ago. What induces one not to follow the rules of a society um, that's up to sociologists have been looking at for years. Absolutely. What can be done to correct it? Absolutely. I don't know. Uh, I appreciate those who try to bring the best they can to an imperfect system. Anyhow, thanks a lot. Come again sometime. Okay. Our speaker gets the last word. You get the last word. All right. Last word. And you get it till late 45. I won't take that one. Okay. He's got about seven or eight, depending. I won't, I won't take that one. But uh, th let's thank him again for a good presentation. Thank you very much for coming and for the work the organization is doing. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. A um, couple quick points. One is uh, Florida, yes, is being challenged in the courts. Absolutely. Uh, you know, obviously the hope of the Republicans is the challenge will take longer than the next election. It's always about the next election. That seems to be the strategy of much of what's going on in this nationally is trying to drag things out until after the next election. Um, Norway mentioned earlier that the problem was race. Um, that is true, but Norway is not as homogenous as it used to be. Uh, they have a large influx now of Middle Easterners coming in, and so far anyway, the prison system has survived that influx. While they are overrepresented in the prison system, they still maintain their community focus. But mostly what I want to respond to is the comment made right at the beginning about black crime. Um, first of all, and you know, there's a whole, I, I'll come back and talk, I, I, I've got an hour on this, so I'm not gonna respond to all right. right now. Um, but really quickly, <coughs> yes, more reported black crime, more reported violent crime happens in black communities than in white communities. But we have to not just say that's true, but we have to ask why. And it's a history of racial discrimination, which has excluded lots of young black men from the above ground economy. Retail level drug dealing pays about the same and has about the same job security as retail level McDonald's. 
you're not going to get hired at McDonald's because maybe you have a criminal record, or maybe you're just the wrong color, then you've got to make your money somehow, and it's through the drug trade. If you're, if I sell you a hamburger which is tainted, you can sue me for product liability. If I'm Burger King and, and, infr and in, infringing on your territory, you can take me to court and we work that out. Lawyers make a lot of money resolving those civil disputes. If I'm dealing marijuana and sell you a bag of oregano, you cannot sue me and say I got cheated in my drug deal. At least until January 1st when it's legal, but at least for now. So what do you do? You resort to violence. That means there are communities where much of the economy is underground and much of the economy comes in contact with the police as a result. And that leads to crime because we have, we have eliminated the non-criminal ways of resolving disputes in that large part of the community. But more importantly, I think, is the fact we don't know who commits most of the crimes. The murder rate, the murder, the solve rate for murders in Chicago is 15%. So 85% of the people who commit murder are never arrested, let alone convicted. For rape, it's more like 1%. So to say we know who's committing all these crimes, when in fact most people who commit crimes are never punished for it at all, is meaningless. You talk, somebody talked about meaningless crime statistics, and that's because the majority of crimes are not reported. And then you have to go one step further and talk about, well, what do we define as crime? Who's committed more murders than anybody else? How about Harry Truman, who authorized two entire cities to be vaporized? We don't consider that murder. We consider that an act of war. But he killed more people than anybody else. How about the executive at a, at a pharmacy company, at a drug company, where insulin has gone from $10 a dose or $10 a weekly dose up to $1,000 for weekly dose? People have died as a result. But we don't consider that a crime, we consider that profit, profit maximizing. So again, it's, it's what we define as criminal activity, it's who we choose to enforce those crimes against. And one final example, which I love, but is kind of silly, but it's not. Many people have Facebook accounts, including this group, um, and many people at least know somebody who's not using their legal name on Facebook as their stream name. That's a felony, according to the United States government. <laughs> When you signed on to Facebook, you checked that little box saying you agreed to all the terms and conditions, which nobody in the history of the world has ever read all those terms and conditions. But one of them is you use your legal name. And there's a statute called the Criminal the Computer Fraud Act, which the United States government has interpreted as accessing a, a website in a manner not intended by the owner of that website. So you're therefore committing a felony when you sign on to Facebook using a false name. But do you have the FBI running around checking everybody's Facebook pages and trying to run stings on people to get them to sign up with a false name? No, of course not. Because that's a statute which we choose not to enforce. We certainly don't put people in prison for it. There's a great little Twitter account called a Crime a Day, which will tell you all of the crimes that people could, in theory, commit, which would end up in prison. There, there are thousands and thousands of them. But we don't enforce those laws. We don't send people to prison for violating those criminal statutes, because those are white-collar crimes. So who we lock up has everything to do with what we choose to enforce, who we choose to enforce it against, and how harshly we choose to enforce it, not who commits the crime. I want to leave by giving you one, the other talk I was going to give today, but I didn't, is I don't believe in second chances. I don't believe in rehabilitation. I don't believe that our problem is people who are in prison make bad choices. I think the, bad, the problem is that people in prison have bad choices. And I'm happy to come back and talk a lot more about that. Good. Want to gavel us out? No. Nah. All right. No. Okay. I'll uh, ask. <laughs> all right. Sign on to your Facebook. Yeah. Anybody can sign up for Facebook or Twitter. All right. We've got all those things on the website. Thank you for coming tonight. I hereby declare the College of Complex is closed for this week. All right. I changed my.